Okay, now we are on Jeff Schessel. Thank you for coming to the Robert Jackson Center. And what's your relationship with John Barrett? My relationship with John Barrett um, is uh, that I take whatever advice he gives me. Uh, I was lucky to get to review that man for the New York Times, and I loved the book. And uh, then coincidentally, uh, one of Robert Jackson's granddaughters was throwing, I guess, a holiday party in Washington, and we had some mutual friends, and I was invited and got a chance to meet John personally. And uh, then I began knocking on his door and uh, calling his office phone for advice as I was beginning my book on FDR and the Supreme Court. And so John's just been a huge help to me uh, from the beginning on that. What did you know about Jackson before you read his book? I didn't know much about Jackson, uh, to be honest. Uh, I read, early in my research process, I read The Struggle for Judicial Supremacy, which was really my first serious introduction to, to Jackson uh, and also to the court fight. Um, and then uh, around that time, I was asked to review that man, which uh, was uh, my, my real introduction uh, to Jackson more as an individual rather than Jackson as an analyst of uh, events uh, in the 1930s. When you're, you're asked to critique a book, um, first of all, how do you become a critic? <laughs> That's a good question. I, 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 uh, I think in my case, anyway, you write a book, and then they start asking you to weigh in on other people's books, uh, and often on other people's books uh, on subjects that you don't know that much about. So there's always a heavy research component for me in writing a book review, whether it's about Teddy Roosevelt or John Adams. Um, I've not written books on either of those characters, and I certainly hadn't written anything about Robert Jackson. So in the course of writing a review, uh, I will not only read the book that's been assigned to me, but I'll spend some time doing a lot of research on that individual or on that set of issues. And so that, for me, began my, my relationship, uh, such as it is with Robert Jackson. Now, you've, that has become a part of you know, your book, Supreme Power. Uh, there's a Jackson piece to it, and maybe you want to just jump into it. Obviously, deals with the court packing case and the period of time, 1933 through 1937, uh, which leads up to the act, act proposal before the Congress. What did you learn about Jackson as that a thread through part of that, at least? Well, what I learned about Jackson in the context of the court fight is, is just how much Roosevelt really trusted Jackson's advice. Mm -hmm. Jackson was not a major player in, in this conflict, um, but he's present and he's got a significant role at the Justice Department, obviously, during this period. But more importantly, he's got a relationship that goes way back with Franklin Roosevelt. And so uh, he finds himself almost zealot like in the Oval Office at key moments. He's there in the Oval Office when Roosevelt gets the call from Don Richburg over at the Supreme Court that the Supreme Court has just overturned the NRA and the Schechter decision. And Jackson is there with him in the Oval Office in that, in that moment, which he writes about in, in uh, his memoir, In That Man. And uh, so Jackson's in a position whenever asked or whenever there to offer Roosevelt advice. Uh, on these sorts of questions. And uh, while he was not driving, certainly, Roosevelt's policy in, in this area, he has nothing to do with the court packing plan. Uh, he is there for Roosevelt to, to reach out to uh, at, at key moments. And I think the most important advice that Jackson gives Roosevelt in this regard during this period happens right after the launch of the court fight, when Jackson, in February 1937, comes back to Jamestown and spends some time talking to folks in town who he expects would be the president's natural supporters on the court plan. And he finds that the, the, that the folks in Jamestown are, in Jackson's words, baffled by the court plan, that the president hasn't done enough to prepare them for what he wanted to do with the, with the Supreme Court. And uh, he's, he's not doing enough to persuade them. And so Jackson writes a very frank letter to FDR. And I spent a lot of time in FDR's correspondence. And I'll tell you, um, Roosevelt, particularly in February 1937, really didn't receive anything like this. It was just a very frank letter to the president that Jackson composes when he goes back to Washington and says, I've spent some time among the plain people, as Jackson puts it. And he says, your argument isn't convincing anybody. And you're actually losing ground instead of gaining ground. And he pushes the president 
to be very direct about his purposes in packing the court, to really take on the court rather than to do it by indirection as Roosevelt did and pretend that the whole thing is a matter of judicial efficiency, to say this is about ideology, this is about a conservative Supreme Court that is standing in the way of the New Deal. You should tell people that. And Roosevelt finally says, you know what, that's a good idea. And there's, a there's an Oval Office meeting that follows that letter very shortly where Jackson and Reed are visiting with the President and they continue on this line and Roosevelt yields almost immediately and says, you're right, um, I've wasted a few weeks um, pursuing this other rationale. I've got to be straight with the people about it. And Roosevelt begins work on two very important speeches in March of 1937 that really lay out the case as Jackson thought that he should. Do you get a sense that, and this is all obviously hindsight, if they had started off in that mode regarding that realm of thinking rather than what it was chosen, that it, the success probability would have been higher? I think that Roosevelt's decision to mask the court packing plan in this false quest for judicial efficiency to suggest, as he and his attorney general Homer Cummings did, that the reason to pack the court and indeed to increase the number of judges throughout the federal judiciary was because the, the courts were filled with old men who were slow and behind in their work, when in fact the numbers proved that this was not at all the case. Uh, th that Roosevelt's uh, giving in to the temptation to be so clever about this really cost him very badly in terms of his credibility with the general public and also with a lot of his natural supporters in, in Washington and in the Democratic Party. They felt that they were on the president's side with respect to the New Deal. They believed that the Supreme Court should get out of the way of the New Deal. But they didn't like the fact that Roosevelt was cloaking his motives. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it made his ultimate motives seem very suspect to those who were inclined to distrust him to begin with. And this seemed to them proof that he had his designs on a dictatorship, that in a sneaky way he was trying to control the Supreme Court so that he could then have absolute power over all three branches of government. As, as we know that ultimately the uh, matter was not referred out of the Judiciary Committee, ultimately Van Deventer uh, decided to resign and, and things sort of just dissipated. Uh, did, in your research, did Jackson talk much about it? Uh, the struggle for judicial supremacy. Well, let me back up. The struggle for judicial supremacy book, which came out 1941. 41. January. What was that? Why did, why did Jackson feel compelled to write that book? Was that part of that experience? Well, he, he, he certainly, um, I'll just take a step back to Jackson's role yeah. in, in the remainder of the court fight. There were a couple of key points where Jackson made strong public statements on behalf of the court packing plan. He was no great fan of court packing itself. It is probably not what Jackson would have chosen to do, but he did believe that the court needed to act with restraint. This was a common theme of Jackson's, which he develops uh, very uh, fully in, in the struggle for judicial supremacy, and you can see it in his work on the, on the Supreme Court, obviously. Um, but Jackson, um, again, acting on his own advice, felt that he needed to make the case directly for the president's purposes. And Homer Cummings, when the, the, the Senate Judiciary Committee held hearings on the court packing bill beginning in March 1937, and the first witness that they called on behalf of the administration was Homer Cummings, the Attorney General. And Cummings gave a very smooth presentation, but he argued almost entirely on the grounds that the court was inefficient and needed help with its work, and so therefore it needed new justices. And this this case had been battered for a month and it was rather remarkable to many people that Cummings was willing to make that argument again. Mm -hmm. Jackson tried to correct the error a day later when he gave testimony and he made the case as he urged Roosevelt to make it and indeed as Roosevelt himself had begun to make it, which is to say that this was a conservative court that was out of step with the will of the people, uh, that it was acting on not constitutional grounds, but on the basis of its own economic predilections, and that it needed to step back and allow the will of the people to assert itself 
through this legislation, which in his view was perfectly constitutional. And so the general view was that Jackson gave the most effective presentation on behalf of the court bill, and he won a lot of praise for it, even from those who didn't support the court bill. It was such a masterful, lawyerly, clean presentation in contrast to Cummings' smooth and sort of disingenuous presentation. So that was an important contribution that, that, that uh, Jackson himself made uh, to the president's case over the course of that. He also gave a speech, at, at a couple of speeches in late March, uh, in which he suggested that uh, there would be greater labor strife in the country if uh, the, the court um, was going to stand in the way of, of the, the Wagner Labor Act, the National Labor Relations Act, and um, saw this as, again, a justification to uh, pass the president's plan. So uh, Jackson became an important public advocate for the plan, even if it was limited essentially to those mm -hmm. couple of appearances. Um, he, he was very helpful to the president in that way. Did Jack, do you get a sense that, that Jackson at that time was positioning himself to be a justice of the Supreme Court? I think that it was certainly in the air. In fact, it was not only in the air, but it was in the press. Uh, at the beginning of the court, it, it, it's hard for us to, to see this because it, the, the court plan was such a spectacular failure that it does seem, looking back, that the handwriting was on the wall from the beginning. Mm -hmm. In fact, as I try to make clear in Supreme Power, it seemed to most observers at the beginning, and actually for some time after that, that Roosevelt ultimately would win. He would win ugly, but he would get what he wanted. And so there was speculation from the very beginning, uh, in March 19, beginning in February 1937, who's Roosevelt going to name? He's not only going to get to name one new justice, he's going to get to name six new justices. Mm -hmm. uh, and so who are they? And a lot of names were floated, and one of the remarkable uh, ironies of all this is that a good number of these folks actually wound up being named to the court, not in the wake of court packing, um, uh, but uh, over the succeeding years. And so Jackson's name was mentioned in the papers uh, as one possibility. Uh, Felix Frankfurter, uh, William Douglas, and a number of others who didn't actually wind up on the court in the end. Uh, but Jackson's name was in the air, and I'm, I'm sure this was not uh, outside the reach of his ambitions. Uh, and I think that this was another area where Jackson was demonstrating his, uh, his, his shrewd legal judgment and also his service to the president. Since it was a spectacular failure, when the day was done, was, was there a fear factor that certain of the players, whether uh, willingly or unwillingly, would be tarred because of this? Uh, I, I know you you wrote a little bit about Felix Frankfurter being implicated as one of the masterminds, and he was concerned during the process of whether that would impact his reputation. Well, I can't speak to Jackson's own feelings about that, and uh, others are probably better able than I am to answer the question of uh, what the struggle for judicial supremacy had to do with this, and whether there was any. Uh, uh, I, I, I think that while Jackson does not, in that book, address his own role in, in the court packing fight, um, he did go to some pains to, to make clear to people that he was not, as it had been reported, a member of the president's team that plotted strategy. He was often, um, there, there was a, a group that was informally known as the President's Strategy Board, which was being run during the court fight by the President's son, James Roosevelt, and consisted of Tommy Corcoran and a few other individuals. And it was often reported that Robert Jackson was on the Strategy Board, and there was some confusion about that. Uh, and Jackson wanted it known that he was not actually in this little group uh, who was uh, who's organizing uh, uh, the, 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 the political strategy uh, for passing the bill. Um, but he was involved, and I think there was some question in subsequent years, not only on Frankfurter's part, but on others' part, whether there, there would be a taint associated with this, since after all it was a failed undertaking. At the same time, uh, many people had come to feel by that point that it was a successful undertaking. Roosevelt always said in later years, we lost the battle, but we won the war. He'd lost the battle to pack the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court had changed. The switch in time that saved nine. Suddenly the Supreme Court that had been striking down all the New Deal programs was now upholding the New Deal programs. And, and he and others uh, around him, and uh, I can't speak to Jackson's personal view on this, but I think uh, uh, 
uh, a good many uh, of Roosevelt's, uh, members of Roosevelt's inner circle believe that Roosevelt had essentially forced the change. He had put enough pressure on the court that Owen Roberts, the swing justice, had swung. And uh, I, I'd be surprised if Jackson himself wasn't of that view, uh, particularly given what he wrote in The Struggle and also what some of his correspondence seems to indicate around the time. Curious. If you had to critique your book, how would you critique it? Interesting question. I haven't had that question before. Uh, well, I, I think that um, it, I, I won't say anything positive about my own book. That would be unseemly, especially on video camera. Um, <laughs> I, I think that one of the, the challenges uh, that this book presents for the, uh, for the general reader uh, is that I, I, I do expect them to sort of walk with me through a lot of historical context, through a fair bit of law, and also introduce them to a fairly wide range of secondary characters. They're in there because I feel that the secondary characters are absolutely critical to the telling of the story. Everything that I've just mentioned is in there because I felt that it's important to put in there. Um, but I will say that when I uh, signed this book contract a number of years ago, my publisher was very clear, my agent was very clear, they thought this was a nice little short book, that it would focus on the six months of the court fight. Here's Roosevelt in the fray fighting for this bill. We might certainly would have to do a brief kind of sidebar bringing people up to speed why this was necessary. And, uh, and then we tell the story of this political brawl and then, and then we're out. 300 pages or less, thank you very much. Um, I decided pretty early on in the process that I had to write a different kind of book. And I recognized that um, I would be asking more of my readers that in fact um, the court packing bill doesn't happen until more than halfway through the book. Um, because I came to feel that the backstory wasn't backstory. It wasn't just a little context that you need to get to the, to the brawl, that actually you need to understand uh, w what is happening between Roosevelt and the court, what is happening in the country, what Roosevelt's options are, how he weighs his options, and how by a process of elimination he comes to this remarkable decision to pack the court. And without all of that, you can't possibly understand what happens in those six months that follows. And so for me, the, the initial part of the story is at least as dramatic and probably more significant than the court packing fight itself. But I recognized as I began to write that book rather than the one I was contracted to write uh, that I would probably lose some readers along the way, that I'm writing a longer book and, and uh, a book uh, that, as I said, asks more of, of its readers. So that would probably be my critique of it. I stand by the decision. Uh, I feel like it was the right decision for this book. Uh, but uh, it's not a decision without some cost, and also literal cost in the sense that the book is longer and therefore costs more. Again, you lose more readers generally when you do that too. So uh, it's always a trade-off for authors, um, and uh, it takes a lot of discipline to leave stuff on the cutting room floor. Uh, who, who are the chief protagonists in this book? I mean, we got, we got <coughs> Roosevelt, yes, but th there are the, the, I don't want to say the secondary because they're principal guys, but you have the, the proponents, you have the uh, uh, opposition. Who, who are the principal players? I, I really think the principal players in this struggle are, are Franklin Roosevelt, obviously, um, but also Charles Evans Hughes. Mm -hmm. And Hughes was a master politician. He was a master politician in the years before he served on the Supreme Court, the years between his two stints of service on the court, and also while he was on the court. And Roosevelt really felt uh, after the, the court packing fight that he had been outplayed by this master politician. Hughes began as a, as a reformer, a Republican reformer in the state of New York, and he was a, a reform-minded governor in the era of Teddy Roosevelt and somewhat in the manner of Teddy Roosevelt. And then uh, served with distinction, really, from 1910 to 1916 as something of a liberal justice on the Supreme Court. Ran for president in 1916 very nearly unseated Woodrow Wilson in that election, but for a couple thousand votes in California. And then served in a number of roles, including Secretary of State, and became the, the, the best known and most successful corporate lawyer in the United States before he went back as Chief Justice in 1930. 
Hughes was a brilliant man and a very, very shrewd politician. Um, but what you see during this struggle, and by that I mean the struggle between really 1933 and, and 1937, um, when the court uh, is, begins to consider the New Deal, is overturning the New Deal, and then is confronted by the court packing plan, is uh, this master justice, this master politician, unable to control the pieces on the board. He has lost control of his own court. And so you see Hughes uh, sort of shifting to the left, shifting to the right very tactically, trying to find very narrow uh, justifications uh, for certain decisions, uh, trying to pull this court together, and he finds that it's simply beyond his ability to do so. The divide is too deep between the liberal justices and the conservative justices. And Hughes is unable, by flitting back and forth, to assert balance. But ultimately, in the end, he does seem to exercise a very real influence over the swing justice, Owen Roberts, and to bring him along and to put him in a position where he can help Hughes in resolving the court fight and moving the court definitively in that moment to the left in the middle of the, the court, the switch in time that I mentioned before. And so Hughes is, is playing brilliant politics in 1937 within the court and also nationally. Hughes deals a very severe blow to the court packing plan by writing a public letter to the leader of the Senate opposition taking apart the premises of the court packing plan. And uh, popular cartoons at the time portrayed this Hughes letter, as it was known, as a bullseye going, you know, as a, as a cannonball going right through the bullseye of the target. It had a devastating effect, just as Hughes knew it would. And so you have a, a titanic struggle between these two people, the head of the executive branch and the head of the judicial branch, being played out in the struggle. Um, but there are all sorts of other compelling characters, too. Um, in, the, in the Senate, you have the Senate Majority Leader Joe Robinson. You have the leader of the Senate opposition to the court plan, a Democrat named Burt Wheeler. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, you have the players in the administration as well, from the Attorney General Homer Cummings, uh, who had a major, major role in this, to the outside advisors like Felix Frankfurter. So it's a, it's a very rich field of important characters. And I think that's a real benefit of, of your book in reading that is you do bring in all of those players. It's not a simplistic matter. There are several plates that are turning, several agendas involved, and uh, I think you've, you've captured that well. For the, for the camera, I'm going to list the name of the justices, and maybe you could just simply, <coughs> you don't have to necessarily give a biography, but for a liberal conservative, because clearly there's this a divide, and I'm not sure over time many people really know where other people lie, but uh, Sutherland. Sutherland uh, was an interesting character. He was born in Britain. He was sort of the intellectual leader of the conservatives on the court. The conservatives on the court of the 1930s were known collectively as the Four Horsemen. Uh, and um, they uh, were a pretty severe lot. Uh, Sutherland was actually a genial person, personally. Um, but he was the one who really uh, wrote the most important conservative opinions of the preceding decade of the 1920s and uh, wrote some of the most uh, powerful decisions and uh, uh, majority opinions and dissents uh, in the 1930s. Uh, and so he, um, he essentially drove the, the decision making on the right on the court at that time. Uh, Pierce Butler? Pierce Butler was a, a combative, nasty individual. Uh, one of the conservatives on the court um, had a, a very uh, turbulent reign as president of the University of Minnesota. Uh, he had been uh, raised in a log cabin and um, had generally been a, a difficult, impossible person to deal with going back, uh, way back. Uh, and um, so he was, um, he was not an intellectual leader of the conservatives on the court, but he was a very reliable conservative vote. Owen Roberts? Owen Roberts was a mystery uh, to just about everyone who knew him, uh, those who had known him for decades and, and, the, and his brethren on the Supreme Court. Uh, Roberts uh, had been a, a, a brilliant law student at the University of Pennsylvania, so brilliant that as he graduated, they hired him to begin teaching immediately. Um, he went on to great success as a corporation lawyer in Philadelphia uh, in, in private practice and was uh, entrenched in the Republican establishment there in that very Republican city at the time of Philadelphia. 
and uh, came to the attention of uh, the Republican leadership uh, of the state. The Republican senator was a friend of his dating back to Penn. Uh, and so when President Coolidge was looking for somebody smart but safe to run the Teapot Dome investigation, the investigation and prosecution of the, the scandals of the Harding administration, they turned to Roberts. And Roberts did a, an honorable job in that role. He did an effective job. And so he won the support not only of Republicans uh, who had put him there, but also of Democrats as somebody who uh, didn't uh, conduct this as a whitewash or uh, a, a partisan uh, sort of uh, purging of the ranks, but dealt with it very honestly and effectively. And so he uh, was appointed to the Supreme Court in 1930 by, by Hoover. And there were questions at that time, and the questions persisted as to exactly how conservative he really was, or how liberal he might in fact be. And there were enough indications of both that both sides were pretty happy when he was appointed to the court. And the confusion continued for some time. But early in Roosevelt's tenure, he seemed to align himself very strongly, in fact, vehemently with the conservatives uh, in, in overruling the New Deal. He wrote some of the most important decisions. Uh, he wrote the majority opinion that overturned the AAA, the agricultural program. He wrote the opinion that overturned the Railroad Retirement Act. Mm -hmm. Scathing opinions, um, uh, cont just contemptuous in, in their language. And so he seemed not only to be voting with the conservatives, but he seemed to be wholeheartedly among them. And he joined them in 1936 in overturning New York State's very carefully drawn minimum wage. And so it seemed that he was lost for good. And certainly the New Dealers felt that way. And yet it was Roberts who in 1937 suddenly upheld Washington State's Minimum Wage Act, which was virtually identical in every respect to the one that, that Roberts had voted to strike down less than a year earlier. And it was Roberts who joined Hughes and the liberals in upholding the Wagner Act, uh, which was uh, much farther reaching than any minimum wage decision was going to be. Who's Brandeis? Brandeis, uh, old Isaiah, as, as Roosevelt and others referred to him, uh, was the liberal sage on the court. Um, and he was the oldest man on the court, but he was also probably the most connected to the times and to the New Deal and had all sorts of relationships with his young protégés and former clerks who were taking important positions in the administration. Uh, at the same time, Brandeis was famously an enemy of bigness, the curse of bigness, as he put it, in all of its forms, both governmental and, and corporate. And so he had some real suspicions about the New Deal as it was being developed. He had suspicions, concerns about the NRA, the AAA. And so he joined in the 9-0, as everybody did, the 9-0 decision that overturned the NRA. And after that decision, he, he brought Tommy Corker and the president's uh, young advisor into the robing room and said, you tell your president that he can't centralize everything. He needs to go back and rethink exactly what he's doing. And so uh, Brandeis was a, a frustration as well as a hero to, to many of the New Dealers and New Deal lawyers. Benjamin Cardozo? Cardozo, also a hero uh, to the New Dealers, and probably Roosevelt's biggest fan and admirer on the Supreme Court. Cardozo was a very gentle soul and had a good relationship with Roosevelt going back um, to uh, his years as chief judge of the New York State uh, Court of Appeals. And uh, Cardozo was pained by uh, the difficulty in which the court found itself. He found the court to be a very difficult and unpleasant place to be. He often referred to it and to Washington as his prison and uh, would have liked to return home to New York. The contentiousness of what was happening in the court in that era uh, was uh, deeply uh, wounding to, to Cardozo. So it was a tough period for him. Um, but he also wrote some very important decisions during that period, including the one upholding Social Security. Harlan Stone? Harlan Stone uh, is another one of the very interesting cases on the Supreme Court. And he was aligned by this time very consistently with the liberals on the court, with Brandeis and Cardozo. Uh, but he was a close friend of Hoover's. He had been Coolidge's attorney general. He was a real Republican from New England, one of the most, probably the most Republican part of the, uh, the country. And uh, he had no uh, particular affection for the New Deal and what Roosevelt was trying to do with it. But he was a firm believer in judicial restraint. 
and he believed that Roosevelt was entitled to make just about every mistake that Roosevelt and the Congress wanted to make in the regard in regard to the New Deal. And so he was very uh, strongly aligned, as I said, with the liberals, and began writing uh, in this period some of the most powerful dissents ever written uh, by by a Supreme Court justice. His dissent in the Triple A case. Uh, today is a is a still a landmark dissent. It really still rings out, and it's one of the, the clearest, purest, and strongest statements for judicial restraint ever made by a Supreme Court justice. James McReynolds. McReynolds, in the words of Felix Frankfurter, was a hater. He was a hater, and he was pretty well hated uh, by just about everyone, including most of the other justices. Uh, even the other conservatives weren't particularly in love with McReynolds. He was an incredibly disagreeable personality. And the story, perhaps apocryphal, goes that Woodrow Wilson appointed him. He was Woodrow Wilson's attorney general. And that Woodrow Wilson had appointed McReynolds to the court to essentially kick him upstairs and get him out of the cabinet meetings and put him someplace where nobody except the other eight justices would really have to deal with him. He was a vicious anti-Semite and refused to sit next to Brandeis or Cardozo in the official photos. One year he actually refused to turn up for the Supreme Court's official photo because he didn't want to be pictured with Brandeis. And uh, when Brandeis was on the court, but Cardozo was not yet on the court, uh, McReynolds actually went to Hoover and begged him not, in his words, to, quote, afflict the court with another Jew. Hoover went ahead and appointed Cardozo anyway. And during Cardozo's induction ceremony, McReynolds sat reading the newspaper very loudly, rattling the newspaper and holding it in front of his face. Uh, there are countless stories, most of them I had to leave on the cutting room floor yeah. because they all repeat each other, but of, of McReynolds' uh, difficulty. And McReynolds, if, if Sutherland was the superego of the Four Horsemen, McReynolds was the id. And he would issue these extemporaneous dissents. He would have something on paper, but he would sit at the bench and he would just begin to speak. His voice would grow high and shrill and he would pound the table. And uh, after the court by a 5-4 margin upheld the administration's monetary policy, McReynolds delivered one of these impassioned dissents and said, this is Nero at his worst. The Constitution as we know it is gone. And so uh, he was also rumored to have said, uh, that I'll never retire, uh, in his words, as long as that crippled son of a bitch is on the White House, is in the White House. And so uh, this was this got back to Roosevelt, and it was another indication to Roosevelt that none of these guys were going to walk out of there alive. They were all going to stay on there until the bitter end. Well, one guy did leave, Willis Van Der Vanter. Uh, what about him? Van Der Vanter uh, was uh, appointed... Um, uh, by Taft, um, as uh, were a couple of these guys. And uh, Van Devanter was a, a, a quiet uh, and, and thoughtful but deeply conservative individual. Uh, and he was liked by the other justices. Brandeis liked him an awful lot. Um, uh, he was very understated. He was from Wyoming. Uh, he had that sort of uh, western prairie sensibility. Um, uh, but he also unerringly aligned himself with, with corporate interests and uh, with the other conservatives on the court. And he had been itching to get off the court, as had Sutherland, uh, uh, on the eve of, of Roosevelt's election. Um, they wound up staying, not because Roosevelt had been elected, but because the Congress, in a fit of fiscal discipline, had slashed briefly the pensions of Supreme Court justices. They then restored the pensions, but the justices felt very insecure. This was the Depression, after all. And they were, felt very insecure about the prospect of Congress doing it again. So they stuck it out for a while. Um, but it's Van Devanter who conspires with the, the leaders of the Senate opposition in the middle of the court fight to retire, to finally retire, um, and to give Roosevelt his first opportunity to appoint someone, which really pulls uh, the last leg out from under the Supreme Court packing plan. The conspiracy, who did he conspire with? He, uh, he conspired with William Bora, uh, the, the Idaho, Idaho Republican, and Burt Wheeler, uh, who was the Montana Democrat who was leading the Senate opposition. And the timing of Van Devanter's retirement was carefully worked out with the two of them for, to deliver maximum effect, maximum political effect. Talk about political effect. I, I read uh, that during the uh, 
case as it was really starting to heat up an awful lot of use of the radio, radio addresses. Mm. Was that a medium used a lot prior to this type of... I know the print media, of course, has been used forever, but it just seemed an awful lot of radio address, radio address, radio address, both sides. Did that, was that remarkable at that time period? You know, I, I, that's a very good question, and uh, I'm, I'm not the best historian to ask about that. Uh, I, I don't have the sense that this was the advent of, of radio campaigns. I mean, um, Roosevelt had been using the radio masterfully for some time. Uh, and, and so had others. And a lot of this um, political activity had essentially been transferred from the meeting halls to the radio, beginning really in earnest in the mid, really the late 1920s. Um, and so whether the, the court packing fight that did play out dramatically over the radio, whether that uh, represented a, a, a kind of a spike or a new level, um, that's a very good question. I don't have the answer. What is the question, I, I, as I said downstairs, what's the question that you haven't really been asked or I should ask you about this without giving away your speech today? <laughs> well, I, I think the, the, the critical, uh, one of the, the critical questions to ask about this is why the court switched? Why Owen Roberts switched? And uh, I'll ask the question and, not, and then not entirely answer it. Because I think it's, it's very difficult ever to say what motivates a justice to decide as he or she does. Uh, and it's not always clear that the justice himself or herself knows why they've decided as, as they've done. And uh, Roberts himself later joked, who knows why justices decide as they do? Maybe the breakfast they had has something to do with it. And uh, so there is a certain impossibility um, in, in nailing this down definitively. There is no smoking gun in most cases. That said, um, Roberts went to some lengths late in his life. Um, he wrote a long memo, which he gave to Frankfurter, who published it after Roberts' death, um, to suggest that he hadn't really switched at all. In fact, he said, my position on the New York minimum wage law, which I struck down, and on the Washington State minimum wage law, which I upheld, are perfectly consistent. Uh, the, 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 the briefs were different, the arguments were different, the issues were different, um, and so my votes were different. Um, but uh, I think when you, uh, I won't uh, try to do this here, but when you take the case that Roberts makes in this memo and you break it apart, you see that it is an elaborate justification and a denial of what, a reality that was obvious to everyone, mm -hmm. which is that these two laws were essentially identical. And he switched, he changed his mind. Uh, or, and uh, whether he did so because he'd had a genuine conversion or whether he did so uh, uh, for tactical reasons, uh, it can never be known. He burned his papers uh, before he died, and those papers probably didn't contain the answers to begin with. Um, but I think that what I try to do in the book is to describe Roberts as others knew him, and to uh, quote as extensively as I can, reasonably, from his opinions, and to lay the facts out there. So you can get to know Roberts. You can understand as best we can the way he thought, the way he operated, and to understand uh, outside the chambers um, the sort of man that Roberts was. Uh, I'm not talking about his personal life, but I am talking about the fact that Roberts was kind of a man about town in Washington. He wasn't a young man. Uh, but he was the youngest man on the Supreme Court, and he was very social, and he went to a lot of dinner parties and hosted dinner parties and so forth. And, and according to those who knew him pretty well, he cared a lot about what other people thought of him. This wasn't true of most of the other justices. Uh, some of them, like McReynolds, couldn't have cared less. But he cared very much, and he seemed to take real satisfaction in the fact that Republicans talked about him as a possible challenger to FDR in 1936. He was flattered by this. Stone was also talked about at one point. Stone thought this was ridiculous and did what he could to kill the rumors right away. Roberts didn't kill the rumors, not because he actually thought he was going to run for president, but because I think he didn't mind the speculation. And, and so I, I think in Roberts you have someone who is much more receptive on a certain level to public opinion and much more receptive to the opinion of elites and so forth. And it's Roberts who really takes the brunt of the court's anti-New Deal decisions because he's the swing justice. Uh, 
you knew exactly which way McReynolds and Sutherland and the others were going to vote on these New Deal programs. But there was some hope on the part of progressives that they might bring along Roberts. And then when Roberts went against them, the anger was directed at Roberts, not so much at McReynolds. In the same way that liberal anger today tends to get directed at Justice Kennedy rather than Justice Scalia. You know where Scalia is going to be on these cases. You know where, where Thomas is going to be. But you hope that you can bring Kennedy along. And so when it all begins to really rain down on the court in early, mid-1936, and it's particularly that New York State minimum wage decision that just brings the public, Democrats and Republicans, down on the court. It's Roberts who takes the worst of it. And so uh, when the court uh, has another opportunity to consider the minimum wage issue, uh, Roberts votes with the liberals to take the case. The conservatives in conference say, we don't, we don't need to hear the case because we just decided that case, right? Yeah. And he votes with the liberals, and there's murmuring in the conference room. The conservative, one of the conservatives says to another, what's the matter with Roberts? What's the matter with Roberts is that he seems to be looking for a shot at redemption. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to read it any other way. But I can't say with definitiveness, with authority, as a responsible historian, that I know what caused Roberts to switch. All I can do is lay it out there and let the readers come to their own conclusions. That's my conclusion, uh, and you can probably pick it up in the text. Um, but I'm laying out the facts, not making an argument. What did you miss in the book? What you, I, what'd you mean? Are you now concluded, you've read it a number of times, people have read it, and you'd say, oh, man, I wish I would have either known or concluded something. What did I miss in the book? Um, well, my editor would tell you I didn't miss enough in the book. But, um, <laughs> Uh, that's that's a good question. I, I was not striving to be comprehensive in this book. Um, I really was trying to tell the story in a way that, that people would ultimately read it. And uh, there is a point at which it can become so saturated with detail um, that uh, I, I think what's missing in part um, is uh, more context, uh, what was happening domestically, what was happening even internationally. Um, that. Uh, you want to find a balance between telling your story kind of fairly straight um, and providing sufficient context so that people know this isn't happening in a vacuum, that the court packing fight is not the only thing on Roosevelt's mind. I try to give some indication of that, but I think that it's hard to give enough indication of that to really give the reader a sense of all you know, that was operating in Roosevelt's universe and Roosevelt's head at that period of time. So if I'd had more room, and I certainly shouldn't have taken any, I would have liked to add a little more context. Well, it's a great book, and we're just thrilled that you're here, Jeff, and I thank you very much for your time, and I want to make sure we get you back to Chautauqua so you can take a deep breath, but... Uh, well, thank you. Terrific. Thanks, Greg. I'd be delighted. Got one last thing, you got to sign this book. You bet.